so David, let me let me start by um, saying a bit about this series, especially to people who um, are catching this for the first time. Uh, it really came from me wanting to have conversations with people that I found really interesting. And I was thinking about when I first came across you, David, and I was pretty young. I, I, I joined the um, International Association of Near-Death Studies, I think, uh -huh. and it was set up in the UK by you. Is in the right? late, <clears throat> no, mid to late 80s. <clears throat> yeah, mm. yeah. I, my memory is it's somewhere around the mid 80s, yeah. So I would have been in my my 20s and just um, fascinated by the phenomena. And so your name was very, I, I knew your name because of that. And, and then became aware of your work with the Scientific and Medical Network and all the things you've done. Um, and so this series really was, how can I get to have conversations with some really interesting people? And how can we have a conversation which is not, you know, I didn't, uh, not an interview, which is not like about a book or although I am reading your latest book and it's great. Um, but really it's about the foundation. So what strikes me is that, you know, here we are, we've both lived quite a long life and everything comes from what do you think this is? What is this thing we're actually in? And so I wanted to have conversations which just started from that premise and, and then allowed us to have a kind of private conversation in public, really. Um, so I, I want to start with there, with, with you, David. So you've, you've lived a hell of a life. Um, what, what is it, do you think, that we're in and that we're experiencing? Well, I think one of the interesting frameworks uh, that I've come um, to, uh, to, and I've arrived at, if you like, um, and, and your, your thinking has actually contributed to that, is the, the sort of Gnostic myth. Um, the, the idea that, um, that uh, you fall into life, you fall into sleep, um, you fall into forgetfulness, you fall into time. Um, and the, 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 the name of the game is to realize that you are that light, um, that you are, are inseparably that light, um, and um, you wake up in the process. I can see you're deep awake behind. Um, <laughs> and you remember who you are. And, and the remembering who you are, uh, as Plotinus said, remembering is for those who have forgotten. It's a wonderful line. And so you remember who you are fundamentally, um, which is the one knower, which is the one being. And, and uh, the, the, so you'll fall into separation, you'll fall into density. The Cathars also talked about this. Um, um, is, is that's, 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 those are the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And you fall into a limited identity um, as well, which is socially conditioned, historically conditioned, and so on. And, and so I, I feel that the, 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 the task, if you like, um, is to wake up to that and, and then to act um, from that universal, more universal place, uh, rather than <clears throat> out of particular interests. So and I and I I've, I've been I was actually rereading um, you know, some of your books on you know, Jesus and the Goddess and, and uh, you know quite recently and in fact I may well uh, review them before the end of the year <clears throat> as a kind of reminder uh, but I, I I find that a very helpful framework it makes a lot of sense to me so so well, that's a great place to come in because. Um... The other thing I know that you're, I mean, you, you run the Beyond the Brain conferences, the Mystic and Scientist conference, the whole medical and, um, and, and um, scientific network, which, as I see it, is about trying to bring together science and spirituality in some new way to take us forward. Um, and I wondered how you see those coming together, because what's happened for me, um, which maybe we can get into later, has been a wanting to revise my understanding of that mythos in the light of what science has shown us and a kind of a stepping towards science and a, away from some of that whilst wanting to keep the essence. And I wondered how you in your mind could bring these two, two things together. Well, I, I think there are a number of different interfaces. Uh, and so you, you could start by the, the interface between science and religion, um, which is science and Christian theology. And that's not what the network's about. It's what the science and religion forum is about. It's what Christians in science is about. 
Then there's the science and consciousness interface, which we'll come back to. Then there's a science and spirituality interface. Uh, which is more to do with being in some in some sense, the relationship between knowing and being. And then there is the science and esotericism um, uh, interface, which is a very interesting one because it's also dedicated to systematic thinking, but from a different level of consciousness and with, and with a, a wide tradition, wide and deep tradition um, behind it. And so I, so my, my starting point is, is really to, to um, work out which of these conversations I'm having. Um, uh, because for the science and spirituality, you could say, well, science and mysticism interface is a further one. And that's what we do, mystics and scientists. Um, and that goes right back to the beginning. Um, you no know, ways of knowing, uh, complementary ways of knowing between mystics and scientists, the non-dual and the dual, the nous or now the noose and the dianoia, you know, if you're making that distinction. Um, whereas the spirituality is is more for me, I mean, it implies a worldview or a, a range of worldviews, um, but it's also about being, about transforming the quality of your being, not just the quality of your knowing. So, so uh, let, let's just dive into it. That's the natural thing to do. So, so the shift w the, which has happened for me from those books that you were mentioning to my my more recent work has been to wonder whether whether we're remembering or discovering and whether we've fallen or whether we're arising and i see and and okay. i and and probably the biggest shift that's happened is is this infatuation really just this love affair which has developed with this idea of evolutionary emergence that that everything comes everything is building from that more information is coming into realization all the time in every second in every moment there's more there's more there's more and 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 a kind of wondering whether it's possible to recast the gnostic myth totally as an evolutionary one in other words to go what would happen if we saw everything as evolving from the simplest you know the one becomes two the two becomes three through to you and i here rather than a discovery of something we've lost and uh, sort of remembering something we've lost. And I wondered how that resonated with... Very, you. very interesting. I, I, I think um, for me, <clears throat> um, uh, the, there are two ways of approaching this. And, and I, I become more um, focused on this through um, doing this 45 Days to Awakening course uh, with Jeffrey Martin, um, where there's a group exercise um, a group awareness exercise when you say awareness is and then you say what your awareness is in the moment or how you would formulate awareness and one of the things that came up for me was to say that awareness is within and beyond and, and then I realized that what I was saying was a formulation of the imminent and the transcendent um, and that if you go back right back to the Upanishads you said if you fall if you if you concentrate only on one of these, the imminent or the transcendent, you fall into deep darkness, and and so this this then brought me around to thinking about Whitehead, and and I, I've been thinking a lot about Whitehead in the last period, as you might have seen from my Galileo Commission letter just yesterday. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, <clears throat> the and and his, his his formulation of this, and I I really need to go back to it. It's in the final chapter of Process and Reality when he talks about the prior and consequent natures of the divine as he sees it. So the prior is the transcendent and the consequent is the becoming. The prior is being, if you like, although being is also dynamic. Um, and uh, the consequent is the evolutionary emergence. And, and I, so I, I, I wonder whether um, you actually do still need both these aspects, um, if you like, and, and, and maybe this is why um, all religions have had a transcendent element, but they've also had an imminent um, element. And if you overemphasize one, you get a kind of controlling God. Um, and, but if you overemphasize the other, then um, there, there's something missing as well. I, I wonder how that sits with you. Um, I, I love Whitehead's, the, I love the, you know, the, the word that definitely works for me is the idea of the transcendent or the, the, the ground as being 
Um, and that's because I, I'm, my, my kind of background really is, is kind of a phenomen phenomenological inquiry is what mm -hmm. spirituality has been for yeah. me since I've been small. So I'm looking, what's this, what's this? And when I look at what's this, I see the one thing that everything has in common is being. I mean, it's kind of obvious and circular, but it's interesting. So it feels like the ground quality, the simplest quality of all is existing. And then it exists in all these different ways. So I'm really happy to see the ground when you, and it, you can call it transcendent I, I, or whatever it is, the, 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 the essence, spirit even, as being. Yeah. But I don't want to add any more qualities to it. Because once I then add intelligence or intentionality, or suddenly it's not being. It's now a whole load of things, which I haven't understood how they got there. And uh, we, I, I, it just Occam's razor just makes me want to go, can I get rid of those? Can I, is it possible to see everything which is a quality having come into, that this is the realization of the potentiality of being? That's what it is. That's what becoming is. Yes. I mean, that slightly reminds me of Eckhart. Um, where he said anything you can formulate um, about the, the ground um, isn't it. Um, so you, know, you get the neti neti in, in, in Hinduism that exactly. it's not this, not that. And so whatever you, whatever you can articulate um, is by definition limited. Um, therefore, you're, you know, it's, it's a sort of performative contradiction um, in a sense. Um, so... Uh, I, yes, I mean, I understand where you're coming from in terms of, of not attributing anything, any qualities. Um, however, um, the experience of that being, uh, and I'm also thinking of how this relates to mystical and near-death experiences, um, is quite distinctive um, in terms of the, the, the qualities that people sense and try to articulate and actually Ravi Rabindra was talking about this just last night um, uh, where he was talking about knowing and being and he said that those those beings on the earth who are closest to this ground they also exude um, those qualities of the ground um, which uh, you might look at you might express in terms of love wisdom beauty joy, peace, um, and if, they're, if, they're, if they aren't expressing this um, or exuding it, um, which is a very good word, I think, or emanating it, um, then they, they, they aren't the real thing, in inverted commas. And, and so, uh, that, but that's kind of uh, almost like a vibrational approach um, to, to the question. And I, I'm put in mind of, of an experience I had um, where I went to see um, brother Boris, Boris Nikolov, um, who was a very um, senior and close disciple of Peter Dunov in Seduno in Bulgaria, um, when he was over 90. And uh, he spoke almost no um, <coughs> English. Um, and I, my Bulgarian wasn't up to much at that precise moment. And so I just sat in his presence. Um, and I sat in this sweetness um, of love and knowing um, and he didn't need to say anything um, what he was said enough and said, said it all and i'm sure you've had the experience of being with people of that kind um, and it's very uh, it's yes it's like a it's it's the sweetness of a beautiful sautern wine or the sweetness of a perfectly ripe peach um, but it's applied to human beings. I think the human being shouldn't become harder, um, but juicier and more um, concentrated as we get older. I love that. I love that, that idea. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so I resonate completely with that, David. But tying it back into what we were just yeah. playing with, what I, what I am wondering is whether all of those qualities are emergent. In fact, not only are they emergent, they're the most emergent, which is why they're so special. And that, that what's happening is that through developing into these conscious individuals, the ground can become conscious of itself. And that when it does, it is now conscious of itself, including all of the wisdom, if you like, it has accumulated on the journey. So that the, the very process of becoming 
the, is the not you know the dream of brahman it is the gnostic myth of, the, of god discovering who it is it's just that the god that's discovering is potentiality and that the the god that discovers is all of it and that when we get to commune with that transcendent imminent oneness that is the most emergent place so that the, so the whole the whole universe is kind of flowering into god rather than coming from god that would be the the theological statement of it yeah and, and that's no, what I understand. Your show. I understand what you're saying and i think from from a human point of view that's absolutely right um that um it is um that these these qualities are emergent um but i i still wouldn't want to um, sideline the transcendent and I, I see why, why you're trying to do this um, but because it's it's more consistent with um, the way that science and evolutionary theory um, works and I think at one level um, you know, there's nothing to add I think I think it, and, and one again going back to Whitehead which is something which um, David Ray Griffin talks about in his his new book um, that the the evolutionary direction is one of the creation of value um, and the, and the, the embodiment of value in beings. Um, and so you can see that there's, there's uh, Teilhard de Chardin talks about uh, the emergence of complexity consciousness and, and the omega point of love. And, and I think the thing, I think we probably agree that the, 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 those are the, those, those are what I call the compass direction, um, if you like. And, um, <clears throat> and and that's um, uh, that's what we feel. Um, it's like the entelechy ent um, of um, of Aristotle. There's a there is some sort of growth process which is um, within us, but we have to we have to align and attune to it. If we're only attuned to the outer world and material things, um, then we might miss this altogether. So so just just to be clear, I don't necessarily keep us here, but just to be clear. I, 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 I'm not. The, it, the, it's. It, I'm not dismissing the transcendent. Um, I really. I, it, what I'm exploring is whether the thing which is transcendent to this and to me, and which I get the chance to commune within, is itself the emergence, the most emergent level of the universe. That that's that it. That the thing that transcends the material world is the thing that it's flowering into. So, and, and, and my reason isn't just because it combines with science, because to be honest with you, science is a, is a late love affair for me. Uh, I mean, when I was younger, I had no interest in it because I didn't think it could reveal the meaning of existence. It was just going to tell mm. me about mm. how our iron filings worked or something, you know, which is of no interest. Um, or, but it is a, it's rather that there's such a profound elegance and it fits with my actual experience. So my experience right now is something new happens in every moment, which transcends and includes everything that's happened. So, every, so the past is accumulating. There's more and more information. Everything's new, new, new. And each new moment builds on the one before. And as that's what I'm actually experiencing and what I've always experienced, that's the desire to see whether, could that be it then? Is, is it as obvious as just look? <laughs> it's, it's right in front of us. That, that, and that, that has led to this sublime state which I get to I, I get to touch in my life and which means everything to me. And the reason it means so much to me is because it is the most emergent um, thing. Yes. No, I, I, I understand, respect that. I, I think I, I'm still trying to edge for a both and uh, rather <laughs> than an either or. Well, I uh, love that um, The transcendent imminent um, perspectives. Um, but I, 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 just, I will say one, one thing uh, where I think this does apply to where we are on our human spiritual journey. And I, I've thought about this quite a bit, and I've also discussed it with some of um, my fellow um, Bulgarians um, you know, in relation to what Peter Dunov says about it. And that's the, the, um, the as it were, the, 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 the building up of a spiritual body um, in which... Um, one can consciously exist in, as a vehicle um, after death. Um, no, in other words, this is a sort of substance of light, um, if you like. I mean, I'm, not, I don't, I'm, I'm way off understanding exactly what this means, um, but I get the sense that um, this, this coherence of vibration is actually an achievement, and it's an emergent achievement 
um, which each of us is responsible for, whether we know it or not. Um, and um, so it's as if um, there's a the, the texture which is woven out of our our thoughts, our feelings, our spiritual practice, um, and um, which enables a sufficient coherence. And this is, I think, reflects what you were talking about in the evolution of the soul, um, for the idea of immortality um, to be emergent um, in that in that sense. And that's that's one of the ideas that I find most interesting in your book, um, and which was also expressed in in David Ray Griffin in the piece I sent you recently. Fasc yeah, that is fascinating because, and I was so pleased in the review that you wrote, which was a lovely review in the, in the, um, in the magazine, that uh, you picked up on that because I think that was, that was the big thing for me, that I'd seen, um, I'd seen a lot of people who I respect, Ken Wilber and lots of people, pulling together spirituality and, but not mentioning death. Mm, yeah. And so it was like, well, hang on, how does this fit together? Because surely the biggest question we have, one of the biggest ones is, is death. And, and that, that, that somehow we need, to, if, if, if it, how can we, that's the place where I say, even now, I find people come with me from a scientific background, will come with me up till there, and then they want to pull yeah. back. And, yeah. and I understand that. But for me as a human being, you know, I, I, part of what generated the, 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 my latest work was, was watching my, both, well, being with both of my parents when they were dying and, and just seeing and death, you know, we, if we can't, and hence the reason my connection with you, David, goes back to death, mm. with the, mm -hmm. um, uh, the studies and the near-death experience. Yes, well, I think this, again, is a, obviously a critical um, question, um, and that is, you know, what, what is the nature of death? And it's what I, I tried to cover in my first book, Survival, um, which is originally entitled um, Body, Mind and Death in the Light of Psychic Experience, and it's now entitled in its more recent uh, Death as Transition, um, <clears throat> because it seemed to me that um, th this, is the, this is the story that we need to be able to articulate. Um, so moving from death as extinction, which is the, the standard scientific view, and entirely biological view, um, and death as transition, or a journey to elsewhere, as Peter Fennick would put it, um, without specifying what elsewhere is. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, part of my interest goes back to my reading of Swedenborg, um, which I started my last year at university, and I should have been reading other things. <laughs> and and um, you may know his book, Heaven and Hell, yes. um, where, where he describes um, a lot of conversations that he had and experiences that he had about what it was like to die and and he he says that people are in it when they reach the next world they're actually exactly the same inside as they were um when they before they died which is not really surprising and um, so there's no kind of miraculous transformation um, but he 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 provided really quite a kind of forensic um description and, and what impressed me about Swedenborg when I first read him was that he talked about death and dying as if he was describing a scientific experiment. In other words, it was impersonal, logical, and there was no, no sensationalism about it at all. It was just how things were for him. I, I, it's, it's interesting because I think um, my approach had been, is, is kind of the same again. So for me, what, the reason that I've ended up playing with the things which you were commenting on is because I look at this moment and I go, oh, that's interesting. I'm experiencing two utterly different types of experience. I'm experiencing sensory experience and imaginal experience. I always am. One is the, the world and one is not. It's mm. nowhere. It's, mm. it's the psyche or the soul. So when I, when I come to the question of death, from that perspective, the question I get just is very simple. It's like, oh, well, what would it be if the body wasn't there, there would be no senses. Mm. But what if the psyche is still there? There is still imagination. And then I look at the near-death experiences or Swedenberg or anyone, or I wrote a book years and years ago on all the different views that have been on heaven. And they, they sound like dreams. And I think, well, maybe that's exactly what they are that this imaginal realm has developed 
based on the experience of this one, but now has its own identity. In fact, from my experience of it, it's huge <laughs> and yeah. you know, really vast and, and amazing. Which was, but it, 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 that it's got, it is that it is a shared, we, the, the universe has evolved into a shared dream. So rather than being the dream of Brahma, it's evolved into that because the images of the imaginal have come from the sensory. Yes, I think, I mean, Swedenborg also says that all angels were formerly human beings. And, uh, yeah. and, and he, he talks about the heaven being a grand man. This is his, um, his image. Um, and he also talks about different regions um, were sort of cultural um, <clears throat> creations, if you like, what, what <clears throat> Carol Zaleski called the structure of the religious imagination in her book, Other World Journeys, which was 1987, a long time ago. And she's a professor at Harvard, and um, and so yes, I think uh, that those that 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 is all as it were built up in as an imaginal realm, which it would it would have to be if it was going to be specific. Um, but the the one for me, the one consciousness or, or divine ground, um, interpenetrates uh, everything imaginal because without that. Um, which is the knower, as Ravi was saying last night, then no, you, there wouldn't be anything. Uh, and so, so again, the substance and texture um, is light or imaginal or light in its spiritual sense. And, and then um, the, this is then structured um, as it always is, you know, to make it something more specific. So I, I'm, I'm feeling to share with you, David, something which I haven't shared very much. Um, and some of it's just literally just happened just to, cause I, I, I just wonder what you, you'd make of it. I wonder even if I can describe it, but um, since we're you know, talking about the near death experience, one of the things which always struck me about it was the, the, the light, the, the love light, this, this, and a year ago, I had a, probably the most powerful experience of, of my life where I, I was catapulted into that and there was nothing but that there was no Tim there was no nothing but I was it was just conscious of itself and I was it and it lasted for a while and it had a big impact on me afterwards and the way I've been thinking and I think it's in my soul story in other words it's kind of like well that's God that's that's where it's in if it's evolutionary that's where it's all leading if it's not evolutionary that's where it's all come from Mm. When I say it's where it's leading, it's like it's become conscious of itself and is now that. that, that. And then just recently, really recently, uh, it happened again. But this time, it, the attention for me became much more again about this. And the, the message I got from it, you know, as that happens, you know, like the voice that was speaking to me was what it was saying was, that's not God. That's the ground of being conscious of itself. That's why it's empty. That's why it's pure. That's why it's light. God mm. is God is all of it. it. This is this is this is the wisdom of God. The imaginal is the soul of God. The, this is the body. It's all and the, and the, this was where and the, it wasn't it wasn't that that transcendent thing was it. It was more that that was the ground which was now conscious of itself and that when you touch that and you feel that profound oneness and that enormous embrace that love and that universal beneficence that it changes your individual journey that you are yeah, now someone exactly. who is serving the whole but yeah. this is but that's not it and in, in, in do you know what i'm trying to struggle to say yes that? no i i see what you're i see what you're driving at again in in, in the light of the kind of light motif of our conversation um, and I mean, in one sense, that there isn't anything else. I mean, there can't be. We're all inside it. Inverted commas. I mean, these yes, are all in medical. That's another way of saying it. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, but to realize that in its purity, um, without any content, um, is is that is a, as transcendent as a human can probably um, experience. Um, and then that also people report in the near death experience and what they 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 became it they were they were they were it there was yeah. no separation yeah. and then when people come back and this is partly the message of my second book um 
then they 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 feel they feel the need to embody these qualities yeah and and this goes back to being close to the the closer to you are to the ground or the source the more you're going to be reflecting and imbued with and exuding um you know, the qualities that we associate with highly advanced beings as it were yeah yeah so well, that's an incredible experience um tim and um, i've i've never had anything as as it were mind blowing um as that um but i have on just a few occasions had this sense of divine love um and and it just comes over me mm. um, maybe three or four times the last time it happened actually was at uh, ben seduno's uh, grave um, oh, wow. in sofia and it was very very beautiful it was like a kind of blessing and i can feel something actually as i'm speaking about it um that uh, and i also uh, the sense of being on track um is is important to me this is the kind of remembering part and uh, because the, the it reminds me of this wonderful short story of um by tolstoy um it's in the 23 tales and it's the book my brother had and i i, I don't have it uh, and the an angel um decides it's going to, going to um have an incarnation as a pig and then when 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 it's the pig it has no recollection of anything um no if it's it's former nature as it were um, and now of course that all comes back when the pig is slaughtered and then suddenly the the the, the angel you know, remembers him slash herself again but it's a, it's a nice parable and of course tolstoy was um passionate about um you know, waking up in that sense beautiful <laughs> Uh, well, the, the 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 what I call the big love has has been, I think, probably the that's what's driven me all my life. It's to to that because I think for me, I could feel it as you were describing it. I could feel it, and and I have to say, it's the only time really that everything makes sense in some non-verbal way. It's the only time it feels like mm. this is. I, I, mm -hmm. There's such goodness in this. I can the Galileo project can you i really want to make sure we talk about that um so um i'm gonna just pick that up that thread because I'm, i think it's very inspiring what you've been up to with that can you explain what that is uh yes um well this is a um a project that um originally um we we put together um with richard Irwin and chris thompson well chris thompson was the, the person who um who gave a presentation at the annual meeting i think it was in 2016 of the of the network and um, and then um this evolved into a, a commission for extended science and um, and um then um we had the idea of calling it the galileo commission um because of um the telescope story and and finally the 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 report was in fact written by by professor harold vella and and um but the the point of using this analogy um, of looking through the telescope um is that there's a letter from um galileo to kepler <clears throat> where he says that the professor of philosophy and this is not to do with the cardinals which is the usual story the professor of philosophy at padua assiduously refuses to look through my glass um, because he knows in advance um, that um, th there's nothing really significant to be seen he's the moon's jupiter and the implications of that um, and that, that aristotle had such a hold on the imagination at that time that anything that contradicted aristotle was thought we couldn't be true and so by analogy um, we are um there's there's a lot of evidence in and around um consciousness studies um parapsychology psychical research been going on for well over 100 years um that that we need an extended view uh, of who we are we need an expanded science of consciousness and if you if you actually encounter and think through um this sort of evidence such as the you know, veridical out of body experiences and near death experiences children who remember previous lives um the the the, the um, parapsychological research over many decades and then you you have to ask yourself the question well what if if this these are true if these are facts 
there is no such thing as an impossible fact. And therefore, my theory um, needs to, to account for rather than dismiss um, these um, lines of evidence. So that's, that's, that's the sort of the basic proposition and the reason we're using the looking through the telescope. So looking at the evidence. And that there's another telescope story which I like, which is also indicative, which is Nelson at the Battle of Copenhagen, um, where he, he put the telescope to his blind eye and said he couldn't see any ships. Uh, and then he carried on doing what he was going to do anyway, rather than follow the orders from uh, the senior admiral. Um, so there's a, there's a certain uh, piquancy in, in that, that story as well. So, so we brought together about 95 advisors originally, you know, to support um, the Galileo Commission report and, and, and the website galileocommission.org. And then since then, um, we've grown the support to um, 550 people and about 190 professional affiliates, as we call them. So we've got 270 effectively academic uh, people and scientists um, from well, 30 plus universities around the world um, who support this call for an expanded science of consciousness. That, well, wonderful. I love the telescope. I think it's such a great idea because it's so, so cheeky um, uh, in a good way, because that's exactly it, isn't it? That's the, that openness, which is really the most beautiful thing that's given us all the great wisdom of science. Um, is so easily lost. So, so one of the things which brought me into starting to write specifically over the last sort of, 10 years about science and spirituality was noticing, well, what, I, what I want to ask you is, you've, you've been here, you've been a, a great pioneer of this. Do you think it's getting better or worse? Because my, I'm a great optimist actually, but when I started really engaging with it, it's because I started noticing that this, the feeling in the culture was increasing that of that kind of there was a kind of a macho intellectual that if you're if you're up to it you can see the brutal reality mm. and, and, and when the when i saw the, the the comics starting to really come online with it i thought oh hang on what's going on here and so i started to notice it coming into my friends and all around me was this kind of underlying really this is we know this is true now and all of that spiritual thing that you talk about that's all wishful thinking woo-woo and it seemed to be getting stronger and stronger um and i wonder what your take was or do you think there's a countercurrent? current yeah uh, i i think that uh, well um the phrase that we use we use two phrases one is post-materialist science uh, and the other is evidence-based spirituality Ooh, um, right. and so what the, what the point made by the second phrase um is that we we are we want to be evidence-based um, but we want to look at a wider range of evidence um, and, and, and adjust our worldview accordingly, rather than um, what happens with the, the militant skeptic organizations. They dismiss the evidence as a priori impossible or flawed or, or um, fraud. Um, and there's a, there's a very or organized, orchestrated campaign in this respect. The skeptics are much better organized than um, the, the, uh, I would call the open-minded. I don't, I don't like at all this idea that there's skeptics and believers, um, because there's two lots of believers. There's believers in one sense, and, and I, I don't regard myself as a believer, in inverted commas. I regard myself as someone who is trying to make sense of the evidence um, in an open-minded and rigorous way. Um, and so I, um, I think there's, there is, there's that, and these, these people are uh, they dominate all the parapsychology and complementary medicine um, entries on Wikipedia. There's a group called Guerrilla Skeptics, and they're, they're organized, and they try to ban anybody who, who re-edits any of their pages, which includes the pages people like Rupert Sheldrake and Peter Fenwick and Pim Van Lommel and Charlie Tart. They've taken their um, mind completely. And, and they, they also um, have uh, the SPR page. Um, they, they curate that with, with about two thirds or a substantial proportion on fraud. Um, and and the, the fraud in, in, in parapsychology is no more or less than in any other field. It's not as if it disqualifies the whole field. So that, that on the one hand, on the other hand, I think there is a dissatisfaction 
um, with the, the, the extreme reductive physicalism and materialism. And there's a movement in philosophy um, towards panpsychism um, and even towards idealism. So someone like Bernardo Castro um, is probably the best exponent of, the, of, of idealism. But Ed Kelly, um, who's um, the editor of these uh, Beyond Physicalism and a Reducible Mind, a new book coming out in March called Consciousness Unbound, Freeing Science from the Tyranny of Materialism. Um, the, the, those three, those, those books are um, the, the, the sort of gold standard statement and discussion um, of a wider view where the brain is not responsible for producing and generating consciousness, it's responsible for limiting and shaping and filtering. Um, and this is an idea, as you probably know, that, that goes back to William James. Um, so I think that there, there is an opening, but on the other hand, uh, and this is the deeper issue, there is this question of what really is a human being? Uh, and the, the, the new atheist um, uh, answer to this is we're just sophisticated biochemical machines and the future human uh, will be upgraded um, with um, microchips and, and enhanced cognitive um, uh, in, you know, abilities. And, and I, I call this, I, I, I've just wrote an editorial recently um, called, um, with the, well, saying that we, sh we need gain of wisdom rather than gain of function. Um, and the gain mm. of function research is extremely dangerous and what, what, what's being going on at the moment. But the, the deeper issue is, is, is this mechanistic view of the human being. And so the Galileo Commission, um, I think, stands for the exploration of this deeper nature corresponding to the kind of deeper experiences that we've been, we've been talking about. And the emphasis is not on technological enhancement, but spiritual transformation. In other words, the emphasis on the inside, the psyche part, uh, rather than the, the mechanics of the outside. And, and, and I think this is you know, the, the, the fourth industrial revolution, um, which is talked about at, at the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset, and um, this has also been sort of in the internet in the last few months, um, that that's a transhumanist agenda um, where the direction of travel, even someone like Martin Rees agrees with this, the direction of travel is, is, is to become cyborgs and, and, and to become you know, one with our technology, the Neuralink of um, Elon Musk. And, and I, I, think, I think we need to resist this, not resist technology as such, but I think we need to resist the definition or the narrowing of the definition of the human being to, um, the, to exclude um, the, the transcendent and the inner dimensions. And, and really what I think the human journey is about is not becoming cleverer and becoming wiser. And, and as... Um, E.F. Schumacher said a long time ago, says, humanity is now too clever to survive without wisdom. I love that line. I read that line in one of your, your emails or messages just recently, I thought, and I, I wrote it down. I took it aside. It's a great line. So I find myself, um, oh, I don't know, sometimes I just think I'm just sort of so, I don't know, because I kind of, I kind of find myself agreeing and disagreeing with everybody. The, 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 um, so I feel... Uh, so I, I look at the, the new atheists and Richard Dawkins and all of those, and I see them still fighting the battle of the enlightenment against mm. irrational religion. And I'm sitting yeah. there with them going, yeah, go for it. But I see them missing that spirit, that there's a level, there's something in there. Let's call it, let's call it spirituality for one of a better word, but there's something in there, which is not just about, it's not just of that uh, previous age and that therefore they can't see any of that. So that what science seems to have done so far, from it looks like to me, is that it's been so successful with physics, particularly, and mm -hmm. it blows my mind what we've learned with physics, because it's the first level of emergence, and because it's the most repetitive. It, you know, the, to use the, it's the habits of nature are formed very strongly on the physical level, so you can repeat things easily, and it's just, we've worked out a way to understand that level of emergence we're starting to do the same with biology but really with the psyche we haven't even begun not really 
not on those sort of levels because not it's not that, that level. type of thing no. we, because we can't in the same ways and my feeling is that and then what happens like you said is that then it becomes like well the psyche anyway is really just the the biology so the more we can find out about the biology we'll know about the psyche because that's what it really is which yeah which it, which completely fails to see that it's a it is i i to me, it's just like, look, it's a different level of emergence. It's inescapably that, because no matter what biological information you amass, it will have no meaning. And yet in psyche, there's meaning, there's narrative, there's story. There's all things that don't exist on the biological level. It's an, so it's another level of information, which we have to account for. So, and I, so I find myself, what my contribution, I'm trying my best, is to try and develop a trans-scientific spirituality. Mm -hmm. which can i'm not a scientist i can't pretend to be i do my best to understand it as authentically as i can which goes look this impulse needs to continue but what i see happening and, and i'm going to take part in your beyond the brain uh, conference shortly and um part of what i want to explore there is what i see is that generally those who are trying to do this tend to see the solution as a kind of return to idealism as like uh, uh, we need to get back to this thing that it's all consciousness and uh, ironically for me that I've, having written many many books saying that i no longer yeah, think that's probably that's i don't think that's going to work yeah. and that actually we need to go forward to something quite new if we want this paradigm to really shift yes i mean i think that's where harold valar comes from in the galileo report with the sort of dual aspect monism um, or you might um, know david bohm i think had a had a similar it, yes exactly take on yeah. on that yeah. um, but I, I want to come back to your uh, for, for a moment to you know to the, the new atheists because <clears throat> again i i agree um that um the, a lot of what's been done in the name of religion um the name of belief usually rather than gnosis yeah. In fact, the, the Gnostics oh. have been on the receiving end of this, and the, as were the Cathars. Yeah. Um, and, and that's when you, um, uh, as Moltange said, it, it is putting a high um, value on your opinions to roast people on account of them, um, which was a very powerful, powerful remark. And so I, I, now I read Bertrand Russell, um, as you probably did, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And so, so a lot of what... Um, is being articulated by the new atheists was was actually said by Russell um, in the early 1900s. You know, free man's worship. Uh, why I'm not a Christian, um, and that still stands. And so, I see the problem as as fundamentalism um, yes. and exclusivism. And so, scientism is 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 the equivalent in science, where where scientism is an ideology and um, allied to reductionism and physicalism, and 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 it pretends to be complete when actually it's one-sided, as yeah. Jeff Kripal also um, argues in the flip. It's not that it's wrong, <clears throat> it's just it's incomplete. And so, that I mean, for me, the whole evolution of science since the 17th century has used this mechanistic metaphor and has also prioritized the outside-in view, the third-person view. So what's real is a third person, but in fact, you can't have any third person without a first person. Yep. As Planck pointed out, he said, consciousness is fundamental you cannot get behind consciousness and um, and well that that doesn't necessarily need to take you it into idealism but it could um, but it it means that you can't define consciousness in terms of anything else and that's 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 where that's where people as you say if you try to to define it exclusively in terms of the brain interface and the biology that then you're missing out the knower you know who is it that is having the theory Yes. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think the thing which I find most, um, I want to say surprising, but I'm no longer surprised by it, but it is the number of um, people I know and really respect who are very clear scientific thinkers who don't even know they have a philosophy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is, this in fact, it's interesting that the Bergson, um, to some extent, had this conversation with Einstein in New York in the early 1920s. And I, oh, really? I read a book about it uh, not that long ago. Um, but the, where, where, where this comes from or comes to a head, I think, um, is 
in uh, the 1930s with, with development of the Vienna Circle of Logical Positivism, right, and right. Um, where they say anything metaphysical is nonsense. Um, but as you say, uh, and this was pointed out by R.G. Collingwood, who was the professor of, of metaphysical philosophy at Oxford in 1940, where, with his essay on metaphysics, um, and he, he said that, um, that they had mistaken propositions for presuppositions. But in other words, um, that you cannot not have a philosophy. Um, it's just built into the very way that, that thought is structured. And you, you have to have assumptions about logical validity, about unity, about the, about the physical world. Nicholas Maxwell has done a lot of work on this um, more recently. Um, but it's like what Feynman said, which used to be quoted by um, uh, Willis Harmon. He's, he said, um, philosophy of science is to scientists what ornithology is to birds. <laughs> the birds, the birds just interested in flying, you see. And, and, and the scientists said, well, we're just doing science, yeah. which is true. Um, but then who is the scientist? What are the methods? What are the assumptions? What are the questions? So Collingwood points out that every scientific um, research is the answer to a question. Um, and the question contains presuppositions. You can't get away from it. Yeah. So for instance, take a, 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 a um, relevant example. The hard problem is uh, expressed in terms of how does the brain generate consciousness? That might not be the right question. Yeah, but that's, a, a that's a theory, asked, isn't it? Exactly. That's well, it presupposes that the, the brain does generate yes. consciousness, which is the very thing which we should be questioning. It, yeah, ex exactly. This is why, this is why when, I, when I started having these conversations, I wanted to start with what is life, or you know, it could be what is existence. Because it, it felt like if we can start with what's, your, what's the baseline, what's the, what's the bottom of your philosophy? Of what you've come to about this because everything else you say afterwards will come from that one way or another and which is why it, my own particular interest is can we change that can we change the cultural philosophical baseline paradigm um, because if we do everything will just ripple through everything yeah no through. i totally agree with that and uh, one of the things if i sort of summing up my interests and mission in inverted commas then transforming world views um, is one of them living your truth is the next and inspiring purpose is the third and i, I have these on a card with an, a tree inside an acorn um, which is my kind of symbol that's beautiful say those again david so so uh, transforming world views yep. living your truth and inspiring purpose uh, so my Wonderful. inspiring purpose is is the name of a project that I do with young people, um, 10 to 16, 10 to 15. Wow. And, and I, I try to, I give them a, a template or structure which enables them to reflect on themselves, who they are, uh, where they're going, what their values are, what their priorities are, and how they, how they can help create a sustainable future, which is the, um, the one that we're doing at the moment. This, this experience I just had recently, when I came out of it or in it, the feeling for me was 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 so similar it was beautiful what you've just said because it felt like everything was the one realizing itself in different ways and that the biggest thing that i felt moved was was just that wanting to encourage everyone to realize their deepest potential to bring out the goodness mm -hmm. in us um, absolutely I, that's absolutely my that. deepest drive well, as an educator um, and i taught i taught it Winchester for six years in the 80s and in fact some of my pupils um, are endorsing my new book um, wonderful very nice wonderful um, yes it's it's, it's and, a, and you went to St Andrews which my daughter is there right now just indeed just started. indeed and in fact that's where I I became interested in philosophy because it was compulsory um, to do philosophy um, in one of your first two years and, and so that was where I really discovered about existentialism, although I was, I was because I was reading French, I, I already had Camus and Sartre on my mind. My, that's, my, that's a big head start. But then I got Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and, and, and Gabriel Marcel and phenomenology and, and all of these going back. And so giving a larger context, in other words. 
Yes, and I saw in, in reading your book, you've got uh, Colin Wilson's book, um, the, um, the Outsider, yeah, just, and just thinking, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit younger than you and, you know, we're coming on behind, but I remember a friend, a very, Peter Gandhi, who I wrote The Jesus oh, Mysteries yeah. with years and years later. We've known each other since we were children and, and, and done every mad thing together. And his father was a, a, was a vicar in the Church of England. And I remember being a young teenager going around to his place and him handing me a copy of The Outsider and me and Pete going away and reading through this book. going, Wow, what is this? And uh, it's just seeing the ripples of all of these. I feel like family. It's like when I discovered mm. Whitehead recently. I, I missed Whitehead. You know, I don't know how I did, but I did. And then discovering him and going, oh, looking at his face and going, oh, my God, I really love you. You're, you're seeing that, you know, you've been, or sometimes when you have an insight and, and it feels like, oh, yeah, T.S. Eliot was here. He stood on this hill and had this view. That's mm. what he meant, isn't it? And, mm. and that mm. way that we're all connected in this, in this work is a, is a really such a beautiful connection. Yes, and Russell and Whitehead, of course, were, were colleagues in, in writing <clears throat> um, Principia Mathematica. And, and at an earlier stage, um, Whitehead was Russell's tutor at uh, Trinity and was the one who admitted him f uh, with an exhibition. And the, the amusing part of the story is that he, there was another paper which is almost as good, but when he went to the examiner's meeting, he only brought Russell's script. And <laughs> you could argue that Russell was the one um, that uh, should get the exhibition, and so they they he he passed into Trinity and obviously became a fellow at a later wow. stage. Yeah. So I've got one last question, David. I've been so, such a joy to to talk with you. Um, I feel like I've been waiting decades for for this conversation. Actually, uh, it's been lovely to have it. Um, so one of the things I associate with you is these enormous amount of book reviews that you've done. And I see all the books behind you. And uh, when we were discussing meeting up for this, I said, you must be one of, if not the most well-read human being on the planet. Because the amount of, and it's not just like a, a, a superficial review. It's like in-depth reviews of really significant books. And I'm just, do you have any idea how many books you've read? When you think about well, it? Well, thousands. <laughs> it must be I mean, thousands the, 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 the network database, um, when, I, um, when I moved to France in 2014, 19 years of it, or 18 years at that point, um, had 5,000 books on the database. Um, <clears throat> and I, they're, they're, they're not, they're not, I hadn't read all of those, as it were, but they're, <clears throat> I, I think probably what I do now is between 40 and 50 books in detail. Um, a year, and then another 150 I write shorter, shorter accounts of. And, and it, I think that, um, I mean, there was one, one very interesting book I reviewed a few years ago, which was how to talk about books you haven't read. <laughs> and, and, and this was by a, a lecturer in philosophy in one of the Paris universities. And what was so interesting about it was he said that half the take on a book is understanding its context uh, within the field and the position of the author in relation to that context. And, and, and so getting to grips with the book um, means that you, you can more easily do so um, the more depth of context you have. Um, and so I've, I've obviously developed um, you know, a, a depth of context yeah. in that sense over the last 30 something years. Um, which which puts me in a uh, in a fairly unique position. Um, obviously, I have my own views, um, uh, but they in terms of curating this, and and that's I, that's how I see myself. I see myself yeah. as a as a curator. Um, uh, Rupert Sheldrake once said to me, "Well, you know, once I've read your reviews, I really don't need to read the book. <laughs> so I, I got the essence of what it's about, and that's what I try to do <clears throat> is is to convey something important about the book." And I review very few books negatively um, because I just don't I just don't go in for them. And, and the, uh, there's one or two that I've done with you know, near death experiences, which is a completely inadequate uh, treatment. But on the whole, I much prefer to um, convey some insights about books that matter and, and that could have an impact on the reader in terms of developing their thinking around a particular um, issue 
So, uh, so, it, and I'm growing all the time as the result of, of, of doing this. And so I, I find I'm actually paid to do this, which is, you know, a, a nice position to be in. But on the other hand, um, you know, as Schopenhauer once said, if, if only when one bought a book, one could buy the time to read it in. But yeah, I'm all with, with, with uh, and, and so there is, there's always the pressure of how much time can I afford to spend on this book? Mm. And, and, and the, so there's a, uh, and, and that, and I feel that I feel that all the time. And and you know, one book comes in, and five books come in a week. Um, I would say on on average. And so, so if I had to ask you the desert island disc question, could you even remotely answer it? If you know, if you had just one book that you could keep on that bookshelf? Yes, um, I can actually answer that. Um, wow, great! And, and, and oddly enough, I don't sure that I've got it right here because my most of my library is still in Scotland. Um, uh, and it's 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 the treasury of traditional wisdom um, by a man called Whittle Perry. Uh, it was published in 1971. I remember buying it in foils um, in about 1974-75, and I I bought it for a pound. And it's a 750-page book with huge amount of uh, ancient and um, more modern wisdom in it. And I would I would never run out of um, insights, as it were, if I, if I had that book on my desert island. Fantastic. Wow, well, I'll have to look for that. So thank you, David, for um, making some time in your reading schedule um, for this conversation. Um, and uh, I really look forward to the Beyond the Brain conference, which is coming up um, beginning of November. Um, it's been great. Well, thank you, Tim. That. It's been a real pleasure to explore these important themes together.